All right, greetings everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Welcome to Sarai's 35th anniversary. First of all, thank you to Rana, who's been an amazing uh, person and the founding editor of Sarai. And I think Maya's here too. Yeah. Also, I'm the founder. And a lot more of the team is here as well. Uh, Jody, um, Lisa, um, Dipti as well, um, all great people. Um, as you guys know, Sarai's been going on for 35 years, which is a uh, pretty long time considering that it's. Um, close to my age. Um, <laughs> uh, the only thing I've done for that long is be alive. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, during that time they've had about, uh, I think, uh, 450 writers, poets, artists, uh, contributors from all walks of life. Um, a great example of diversity, which is part of our topic here today. Um, so this is an example of diversity done right. But we all know that if diversity alone was enough, uh, then, for example, Obama becoming president would have ended racism. You know, it takes more to it than that. And I guess in one way you could say that when diversity isn't enough, and when it's done in bad faith, it could be called something called tokenism. Um, so to speak more on this topic, which will be a free-flowing conversation, we have um, a few guests here, and I'll let them each speak about themselves, um, starting with uh, you, Nalambri. Oh. So, <clears throat> um, I'm Nalambri, 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 I'm Sorry, I've, I've written some of my stuff down so that I don't forget. So if you don't mind, my responses will be written. And I'll just read them out. Uh, first of all, uh, I am here from the unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory, where the peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation have lived for millennia. It is known to TTCP or the Great River. I dedicate this presentation to Eva Jewell and <clears throat> Ian Mosley for their special report, which is called Calls to Action Accountability, a 2021 Status Update and Reconciliation. A year has passed, they write, since the Kamloops First Nation announced the discovery of 215 unmarked graves outside of former Kamloops Indian residential school. How much has really changed, they ask. For one thing, news of mass graves of children no longer garner the coverage they once did. What we hear are apologies, promises, symbolic gestures, apologies, promises, symbolic gestures, repeat, repeat, repeat. I have been the token Caucasian through my career in uh, the federal government. And there are experiences that I could speak about, but I'd like to go back to a very early experience of mine, because I think that it's difficult to grasp the meaning of inclusivity without an understanding of the impact of exclusion. 
I recall my experience when I was a grade six student in a vernacular region in construction. And I had joined the boarding school run by the Loreto Order of Irish Men. The medium of instruction there was English and the regional language, which incidentally not, was not my mother tongue. But this regional language that I knew well was taught there by the foreign language teachers. I felt out of place and excluded from the music I could not understand and from a language that was not mine. I keenly felt the devaluation of my own learning and felt the tiger. After graduating from high school and after having mastered most of the intricacies of parsing and phrase and flawed analysis, I went back to becoming literate in my own mother tongue and making it an inclusive part of my psyche and soul. Stop there because I don't want to show up. <laughs> that was very beautiful. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, my name is Blossom Tom. Um, professionally, I'm a proofreader and editor of Young Poet. And I was just reminded of something from my own childhood when I was in about oh, grade three or four. And our assignment was to um, take your last name and see what nation that came from. So my last name was Tom. And I uh, went to the library, like all of my other peers, to, you know, whatever we had to do and looked up Tom, found the book, found out it's a Scottish last name. Did my assignment, did really poorly. Very upset. Uh, so my parents were like, we'll talk to your teacher. So I'm, I was born in Guyana, and I was raised by Guyanese people. And uh, so I went to talk to my teacher. And uh, she said, well, you know, I expected you to do something with Guyanese. And I said, I lied. I went a little Guyanese on you. I said, <laughs> you expected me to fly to Africa, figure out where I was from, do the research, write it down, fly back on the weekend, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and she got a little angry, and people got your brain. So I told my parents what happened, they laughed, and I'm not sure what happened after that, but that's just, um, yeah, I don't think she lasted more than a year. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, but that's something that, you know, you have to navigate in childhood through. So this discussion, I'm really looking forward to. Hear me? Okay, great. Um, so, my name is uh, Professor Mohammed Khan Pasha, or Pasha Khan Mohammed Pasha. I am a uh, associate professor at the Institute of Islamic Studies at New York University, and I'm the chair of the Institute of Culture. So, <laughs> you know, after the recitation of all of these titles, you can tell that uh, along with being minoritized in, in several ways, I also have a lot of privilege, which, uh, which I reflect on a great deal. Professor at McGill, but also as a man, um, and uh, and as a brown person in relation to other racialized people, especially black and indigenous people. So I'm very grateful for the uh, invitation to be on this uh, on this panel um, and to talk about uh, tokenization and, uh, and other ways in which EDI, uh, equity, diversity, and uh, inclusion can be out of whack uh, sometimes. Um, I think I, I don't have any you know, particular uh, opening uh, remarks, except to say that uh, you know, I'm looking forward to Yale's questions. And to some extent, um, I think I might talk about something a little bit beyond the idea of tokenization, because, because very often, the idea of tokenization assumes that the people who are being tokenized are simply passive, and I don't think that, that uh, many people are just uh, passive uh, participants uh, in these kinds of situations. More often these days, we see uh, other situations in which there's an active uh, active role, which is even more prob problematic than the one that took place. So um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to let DL uh, take the floor. Thank and, you. Uh, Ask, ask those questions. Um, 
Well, I think that's, that's a good segue because I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you guys have very different backgrounds um, in, in more ways than one. And I, I just want to briefly finish with saying that. Uh, when I mean um, when we talk about tokenization, it's not in the sense that, um, for example, if a company only hires one black person, but there's literally only one black person in town, it's uh, more of a conscious effort. And and I guess what I'm wondering is, and this is my um, first question, is uh, in your careers, uh, I, you know, we just covered our backgrounds, but in you know, in a more recent sense, uh, what would be uh, an example of uh, what made you learn the difference between good faith efforts and diversity and tokenization? So, whoever would like to start. Hello. not just hiring one South Asian person or a black person in one department, you know, because I, people, people would see me and they would say, so where, and I wasn't even from the government, so they would ask me what department are you from, and I would say, I don't know, I'm in the department of the government community, you know, the, the center for autism, and that is something that I really didn't understand, and then, you know, In English, and they would be learning in English. And so, you know, things have changed from where I was in there. But at the same time, there is something that is, when we, when we, when we talk about inclusivity, it is more than just uh, even the broad idea of hiring people, many people within the same you know, department, because the policy is really the same. The decisions that are being made are the same. People who are making decisions have not changed. So, and uh, I would say that in order to be inclusive, it happens only when you look beyond a person's race or sexuality, when diversity and equity no longer need to be implied policies in just society, and it doesn't matter anymore if the leader of a political party is black, indigenous, person of color, there is a turban or a hijab, and then there are no more questions around whether or not these are religious or cultural symbols, and whether or not they hurt or hinder anyone in the individual life. So I think that is, and the other thing that I would like to say, and I, I get permission from uh, Tanya when it's here, it happens when we begin to see the unfocus, and that's what I'm talking about. It's so difficult to see that unfocus. He writes about this in his uh, article, Window Pain. This is not about diversity, he writes, but about studying the grains, the mud, the soil, the wind, the skies that produce a separate reality. And when each one of us stares out of our windows to unfocus, we see different things. How do we see those things? If you do not see the unfocus, he writes, you are not seeing the essence. And that is the essence of inclusivity. And it happens in a shift in power and with transformation from voices that have so far been silenced. It happens with a shift in focus to include different realities when we move beyond a world-class soccer team, for example. And it happens, as mentioned by my great comment, when he says that our stories matter. And uh, I need to say over here that at Sarai, we have been experiencing this for over 35 years, and that is why I am here. Thank you. It was beautiful. I feel like it's hard to follow up when you're going to say something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Is it still on? Yeah. Um, so you, you spoke of deal of good faith and bad faith. So I'm going to leave tokenism out for the next second when we speak about good faith and, and bad faith. And you spoke about uh, diversity of voices here. So I think when 
there's good faith with diversity. It's when someone can come to you and say, oh, like I can come and say, well, um, I see what you're doing there, and it's problematic because this is how it affects my community or my friend's community, um, and have that acknowledged and considered. It's bad faith when I say something like that and say in a board meeting, and the response is, well, everybody else is okay with it, and everybody else happens to be white, right? So that's that's the idea of good faith yeah. and bad faith. And I think tokenism occurs when um, the expectation is, I should just be happy to be invited to the table, and I have to agree with everything. But I think it's important to realize that every culture has table building we all have tables at home. So let's just sort of be uh, considerate of each other's knowledge and experience. And I think that would be good faith. Yeah, that would work well for me. So, sure. So, um, you know, in the first place, I, I um, would um, I would love for there to be a, a kind of um, uh, a society in which uh, racism, uh, sexism, identities uh, doesn't exist, but at the same time, I, I don't believe in, in color blindness or blindness to, uh, to, to gender or uh, this. And so I think that, uh, that we, we certainly need to, to think um, a bit more carefully about uh, the idea of, of an end to, to racism and color and more about you know, how we are uh, dealing with, uh, with people against whom we may have you know, an unconscious bias, for example. Um, George Yancey, the, the African-American philosopher, wrote a great book called uh, Look, uh, I'm putting the punctuation marks, Look, comma, a white uh, exclamation mark, right? And one of the, it's a wonderful pedagogical book. Uh, one of the things that he asks his students to do in his classes is to say, you know, he, he says, raise your hand if you're a racist, right? And of course, nobody raises their hand. No one wants to you know, say I'm a racist, but you know when you examine your own uh, your own biases more more carefully, you realize that you are kind of a racist in, in certain ways. Or I, you know, what George Yancey would say to himself, yes, yes, I am a, a sexist in, in certain ways. And it's important to to acknowledge that in the first place, right? It, it doesn't mean that uh, that uh, you're uh, that you're going to um, exile you to Jupiter or something. You know, it's, it's refreshing when, you know, for example, a white person or a brown person or whoever is able to say, yes, you know, I have racist biases, right? And uh, acknowledging, in acknowledging them is the first uh, step to, to dealing with them, of course. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to make that, uh, that one point about, uh, about being able to, to recognize uh, one's own racism and that colorblindness, in, in my opinion, until, as Sarah Emmerich says, we have a new, whole new dispensation, a new world that we can't even imagine at this point. Uh, colorblindness is, is just an impossible thing. In terms of, uh, of DL's question about uh, <laughs> tokenism or you know the, this kind of thing, in my own experience, you know, I, I have felt uh, tokenized uh, as a Muslim and as a person of uh, of Pakistani origin. But if I were to tell that story, you know, I'd probably get a lawsuit on my so, uh, so I, I would rather not do that. Um, I, I can you know, bring up a couple of examples of um, something close to, to tokenism or ways in which EDI uh, doesn't work in, uh, in real life. Uh, so for example, we have the recent uh, case of the CEO of Google, uh, Sundar Pichai, uh, who is um, who's an upper caste, uh, Indian uh, of Tamil uh, origin. Uh, April was Dalit the History Month, uh, so it's the, the month um, uh, commemorating the history of uh, of people of uh, lower caste or of non non caste the Dalits. Um, and um, uh, I'm sorry, for those who don't know, what, what, what is um, a Dalit? Dalit? Yeah. So so a Dalit is you know what once upon a time we would have called an untouchable man, right? That's the the more common older. Phrase uh, Dalit. Uh, the word itself means 
downtrodden, um, uh, cast on their on their feet, right? Um, so this is this is what it refers to, right? The the lowest caste, or not even within the caste system, really, um, according to uh, you know Brahminical uh, belief. So um, so there was a, a Dalit activist who was invited in April to give a talk to to Google. And of course, you know, certain uh, Google employees uh, spread this information about her, saying that she was, you know, just Hindu phobic. She's uh, anti-Hindu, right? Um, on the basis that she's criticizing you know, the caste system, um, and she was disinvited. Right? So this is a case in which uh, Sula Pichai, the, the Google CEO, you know, he's he has he has a good track record when it comes to uh, to dealing with uh, racial issues within the, the organization, right? Uh, maybe partly because he is racialized himself in an American context, but he was unable to um, to see his own caste privilege to such an extent as to um, as to make the, the ethical decision with regard to uh, to this type of activist. Right. So that's one example that I would that I would bring up of you know um, the person in this position. I don't know whether I would call him tokenized or not. Because obviously he has power, but he isn't standing up for a community in relationship to which he is being privileged, even if he is, you know, he's um, he's uh, exhibiting a kind of solidarity with uh, with other racialized people. The other example that I would bring up uh, quickly in the context of uh, of Quebec, uh, of the Quebec debate around uh, around uh, the veil, the hijab. Uh, are brown feminists like uh, Jamila Benhabi, um, who are you know regularly trotted out to um, to uh, discredit the idea that uh, a Muslim woman can make the choice, for example, to to wear the, the hijab. Sometimes with very valid life experiences behind them, because in their home countries, which are Muslim majority, uh, they uh, they have been uh, they haven't been given the choice to whether to wear the hijab or not. But of course, you know, uh, white majority context is very different from a Muslim majority context. So, this um, this kind of figure is the figure is uh, one that uh, some post-colonial theorists have referred to as the native informer. So I guess that kind of goes back also to the good faith and bad faith. Yeah, so absolutely. In part two, which I think figured away works well with the next question as well. But when it is in bad faith, um, when tokenization is intentional. Um, what would you appear to describe as its goals? What is it, its intentions when it is uh, deployed in that manner? Um, well, I'm gonna I'm going to just jump off of something you said as well. That this idea of diversity, um, and I have to it shows my own bias because I was looking at it from um, and also my experience, you know. Um, of being um, in the minority. But if you look at diversity in terms of people who are diverse are the ones that are being tokenized, it's also a thing. So your question, can you just repeat it, please? Um, when tokenism is intentional, uh, what are its goals? What is, what, what is, okay. yeah. So I think the goal is to, um, when, when the, it's to maintain the status quo. And what I think is really interesting um, and I can't coin this thought as my own. Um, I mean, um, Toni Morrison talked about it during, um, you know, the, the debacle, and in the seventies, I think. And it's this idea that um, white isn't considered a race; it's considered the same as black. Right. So, as a poet, you know, and I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm often. Do you consider yourself a poet or a black poet? And what I've never heard um, my colleagues asked are, do you consider yourself an author or a writer? Right? And this idea, um, I was speaking on a panel on, on Sujak, and one of the students had asked, you know, it was a panel of um, writers who were not white or non-literate. And um, Either or, 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 and um, they asked, you know, why 
do you write about the communities instead of universal values? And I said, you know, you say that as if white isn't a race and white authors aren't filling their books with characters from their community. So who gets to be asked these questions about who has universal human values and who has is just writing for their community? So I that was a long oh, yeah, way around no. your question. Oh no no that, that, that all good. Uh, Um, actually, in, in the sense that um, I'd, I'd like to add to that too, because what was awesome is I think that you know the big difference between um, what is real diversity, which is a, a, an expansion and representation and different point of views, tokenism is more likely to lead to assimilation, I think, in its intent than um, representation. So it's more like being, um, your identity being usurped. Um, so I don't know if you'd like to make some. Absolutely. So, you know, in fact, uh, I was going to say two things. Number one, that uh, that very often, I mean, you know, of course, uh, uh, tokenism can have uh, all kinds of all kinds of goals, as we see from those two those two examples that I, that I mentioned. But um, you know, one goal that we haven't talked about might be to you know, increase uh, capital, increase wealth, and, and so on. So, for example, when when the big banks uh, like Social Bank and, and so on um, paint their uh, paint their logos uh, in rainbow colors for the pride. Uh, you know, this is you know this is something that uh, on the one hand shows their um, their solidarity with, uh, with with communities, sure, but it's also a way of uh, harnessing the power of, uh, of LGBTQ consumers. But the really the really important thing, I think. To tokenism is that it uh, it furthers the cause of assimilation absolutely. Um, so you know, for example, when um, uh, Trump's um, uh, assistant uh, Omar Manico um, was helping him with his uh, with his campaign, one of the things that she that she said to potential uh, black voters for the Republican Party was, you know, look. I'm successful, you know. Trump is my is my man. With you know, when we were we were together in the Apprentice, in the Apprentice, and he helped me. And now I'm a wealthy I'm a wealthy American. I'm I'm living the American dream. And you know, somehow by magic, I suppose, uh, you you can also attain this uh, this status, right? Similarly, you know, in the case of uh, of Jimmy Benefi and other people like this, there's an idea that. You know, as long as you're, uh, as you have wealth, as long as you are, you know, in many ways culturally Western, you know, that you're as close to whiteness as possible, at least, you know, not wearing that thing on your head and, and so on, uh, that you'll be good. You know, that's the that means success, and that is that is a form of white supremacy, and certainly it is assimilation. Good. Yeah, I guess the best what about what you're saying, it's almost like the the tokenizer held up like a carrot on top of, at the end of a stick to keep other people running after this goal that's unattainable, but hey, you know, maybe they could do it, they fell in line, maybe you could end up getting it too. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that you mentioned um, Trump earlier, but there is an example um, that I looked at before of uh, while Obama was president, he had put together this uh, review of of bringing policing into the 21st century and it kind of um, hinged on hiring more black police officers. Um, the problem was what studies on that um, effort found was that even sometimes the black cops, uh, however few there were, sometimes would act more extremely and more biased than the others because they wanted to be part of the system and make their own way up the ladder. So I guess like a, an insidious form of peer pressure. And as such, if there's no change to the system itself, then you just fix a few of the players to look more like oppressed peoples. It doesn't really um, change anything. Um, so yeah, uh, Nilambi, would you add to that? Yeah, well, well I, 
because I was in the government for so long, I think that some of these were like the diversity, equity, and inclusion dream. You have these forms that you call your insensibility dreams. So right now it's all DEI, you know. So what what what, what works for them is that uh, it uh, it makes it seem as though old wrongs are being addressed, you know. So okay, so everybody now has to make sure that all the uh, the squares are, uh, you know, kept off. That you have done all the uh, uh, due diligence that you need to do to make sure that everybody has that DEI. And uh, this this makes the government uh, feel that they are doing something, and it helps the people in the media. It helps communications. It helps policy writers because it makes them feel and makes you know. It, it's very strange because when you are a policy writer in the government, you begin to use these terms as though you have used them throughout your life. <laughs> and I think that that's, that's how they, they manipulate the, the media as well as, oh yeah, and they also work for election campaigns. You see, so when the media asks them a question, they look at the reference <coughs> to who's asking the question and address him or her by name. And I say, thank you, you know, that is not going to be a direct answer to the question. But of course, if you have all these terms that you have to uh, be aware of. So I think that so far it works for the system. And those of us who work in the system were actually also a part of the system. So I hope that we will be part of the system. Uh, making a good living, and the recession is now, but we were not there as the decision makers. We were not there, at least I wasn't there as the decision makers, and it was going to make a difference, except when it came to small groups working in small groups and helping them to get grants, and that's how I arrived here. Um, I, I guess the Question I'd like to ask after that is what what do you think that um, resistance to um, to real change comes from? Why so much effort and only aesthetic um, responses? Um, when you consider that you know some of the company companies that are actually maybe diverse or establishments that are really diverse um, do end up no pun intended blossoming. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, it seems that, and I'm just going off the top of my head, that there is sometimes multi-million dollar campaigns put into giving a fake answer um, as opposed to any sort of real answer that would cost a fraction of that, you know, of just listening to people. And w why do you guys think that is? I mean, uh, you all think that is. Sorry, I, <laughs> it wasn't in the written question. <laughs> why, why do we think that is? Or um, that's, it, that's a big question. Why? Yeah, it's yeah. So so okay. So we're looking past the symptoms to the cause. Well, I I guess in what we're saying now, we're talking about symptoms, but symptoms are something that happened on. Um, but the the more we dig in, uh, the more you start to realize that okay, it's somebody few, or a group of people intentionally doing this, and that they are dedicating way more means towards energy time, energy time towards keeping it that way. So I think that um, it, using the term symptom would be a bit more accurate if they they were actually a group in what they were doing. Like, whoops, we didn't know that um, everything they were doing to keep people of color or, or, or women or uh, LGBTQ at bay, uh, you know, away from decisions of, of power, positions of power. That would make more sense then, but, yeah. Um, so I'm going to start out by being generous. Um, so, if you were to ask a fish, 
if the water is white, what would the fish say? The fish would say, what's water? Water. <laughs> right? So we're living in this environment, all of us, regardless of how we look, love, pray, whatever. Right? And um, we, we're talking about diversity from the perspective of people who are who are, are being harmed. Okay, so let's look at it by the people who are not being harmed. Okay, so I agree. The water's great. <laughs> you know? Um, they have no need to, to question what's going on or why what's going on. Like, it's great. Why, why do you want to change? Why do you want to change? You know? Um, and they're also believing this is why I think it's so important that we have, uh, like Montreal Sarai, who elevates voices um, that are on the margins, right? When we see, um, you know, the predominant narrative of um, if you look like anyone on this panel, then you are not educated, you don't have any privilege, you don't have any wealth, you don't have, you've never been to a, a biology class, you've never, you know, done any of these things. So how could you possibly? being seen as judgment in the world. Okay, so that's me being a journalist. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's like, why would you give up a power of control? If, if I'm able to, if, if you're able to do something, and then you come along, or you come along, or you come along, and you have the same level of ability or better, Plus, you're able to talk to um, a part of the community that has never been tapped on before. You're a threat to someone in a position of authority because now they're going to have to either improve their game or stop you from um, challenging their authority. So that's my generous and generous. Actually, and to, to add to your point too, um, I saw this number. Um, it's from Harvard. That I think it's 57% uh, of um, life admissions are legacy yep. uh, admissions, either legacy or athletes. And so it's funny how the question of affirmative action only ever comes yeah. up for people who don't look like us. And I think that's um, pretty, I'm not sure if ironic is the right term, <laughs> but um, yeah, Pasha or Nalabri. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll just say uh, very quickly that uh, what Blossom said basically encapsulates everything that uh, like, not really needs to be said, but, uh, but I totally agree with everything that, uh, that Blossom said. And I would only add that uh, you know, it's, it's so sometimes, um, sometimes seeing your own privilege and, uh, and, and um, empowering other people means uh, disempowering yourself. That's very difficult for most people to, to do. Um, so, you know, why would uh, would a corporation, um, which is really is on debt, is to uh, is to make money to uh, to benefit itself, um, give up that uh, that power or, or wealth? So, I think that you know, um, I feel this is an unscripted question. It's a, it's a good question. Um, that so, thank you for to the Boston firm. <laughs> yes, and I think again, you know, I think that for uh, change to actually happen, it has to be political. It has to be a political change, and political change is extremely, extremely difficult. And uh, even if you take from the thousand to the ass, for example, if you look at it to what it was pre occupied and occupied and felt it was too open until now. What might happen in the next two, three years? It's 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 very it's it's a four year game, and after four years, things can change radically. And we were back, back to where they were, you know, eight years ago. So it's uh, you know two steps forward and one step backward, and and that and that is also the reason why it is so so difficult. The political thing is also sometimes not there. For the uh, you know indigenous communities, and, and, and especially in the north, 
that we have the health services that we need to have in our country. The education, the educational services, and even the more basic needs, and when we talk in us, why is that so? Why is there you know, so much uh, depression? Why is there such a high rate of suicide? And, and uh, you know, talk about these things. You don't you don't see them on CBC. You don't, you don't hear about them. And that is because the political will is not there. Change is very difficult. And it has it, if it happens, it has to happen with the entire, you know, with the majority of the people thinking of it as their own uh, not somebody else's problem. And I think it's our problem. And that is what I have struggled with for many years, and how do we do that? You know, it's, it's actually difficult, and I think it can be done because of the population is not growing up. Thank you again, really beautifully put. And it uh, leads me towards the, the last and um, main question I wanted to ask because it's um, great to, um, I guess, look for the problems, identify the problems, but um, in each of your minds, what does true and effective diversity look like as um, a way to, I guess, make tokenism um, irrelevant? What would be the prescribed answer to that? I always do it in, 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 in small numbers, in, in small sizes. You know, I can't keep up changing everything, but I try to do it in small numbers. And as I said, the Salai has been an anchor for me because uh, I really don't see any difference. I mean, it's all it's all there, you know, for the compassion. So I think that uh, in small ways, I think that can be done in small measurable sizes. I did that in my documentary. It was a wonderful great class I had. And uh, uh, it was uh, a joint uh, uh, contribution of my understanding of the documentary. And I know I talk a lot about the documentary because I spent 15 years in jail and I didn't feel even if I did a numerous editors and other editors while I was in The reason I walk in so many territories is based on my work. I mean, this is my work. So, this is where, you know, change that has to happen is so difficult and so overwhelming that I always look at it in small blocks where I can make a difference. That's what I do. So it looks like the winds of change are blowing <laughs> now, that, now that DL has asked this, uh, this question. We're dealing with the winds of change. They're here. We don't have to do anything. You jinxed it. So I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure that uh, uh, I'm not sure whether we'll ever be able to, to put a permanent end to the, to the problem of, uh, of tokenism, but I think that you know, um, putting people, putting people of diverse backgrounds on a you know, board or on a group or whatever is very often premised on the idea that they're going to work for the interest of the of the group to which they belong, from which they come, and what. What, what happens in many cases instead is that they work for their own self-interest, right? Sometimes against the, the self-interest of, uh, of that group or in this assimilationist way, you know, they, they get benefit uh, through assimilation and they say to other people, well, you know, you can be like me and you know, therefore through assimilating you can, you can get this, this kind of benefit. So I think that uh, as Nandu has, uh, has said, um, the solution needs to be political rather than rather than you know, within these uh, these structures. And the principle of social justice, I, I think, is going to be important uh, in, these, in these cases. Um, I think that, it, you know, we can, there are a lot of people, you know, there are a lot
lot of white people, there are a lot of uh, straight people, and so on, who are working in, in good faith to, to get the government to change, but we can never uh, assume good faith, right? And that's why we need rules, we need policies to make sure that people are, it's okay, are working, uh, are working for the interests of, uh, of these minoritized or underprivileged communities. Trying not to answer because I don't really have one. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'll take the last word now. So I'm going to. The question is, what would a world? Well, uh, okay. So because if I don't like your question, I'll just. Yeah, it. no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you wider context. So even okay. I'd, I'd like to add a small point to what Nan and Avi were saying before. Uh, smaller steps, and to combine to your point as well, um, it's not just a matter of race either. I think that a lot of. Um, Different people, for example, let's say like in the Me Too context, when you have uh, an accused person who's saying, well, I can never, as the father of a daughter and the husband of a wife, they're tokenizing their own family in that instance to shield themselves. And I think that there's a lot of um, tiny bits of learned behavior all over that people don't uh, necessarily identify as that. And yeah, like the Malbury was saying, small steps should be able to look inwards to then be able to be outwards. So the question was, <laughs> um, what does true diversity look like in your mind? What does it look like when it's done right? I think when it's done properly, um, true diversity looks like a group of well-behaved carrots. <laughs> if you're doing anything, I can get you a pine apple cuter. So, what does that mean? No name for it. If it doesn't belong to you, don't touch it. That means it's a carrot. Okay. Um, no spitting, no kicking, no punching, or anything like that. So, if you can get through a day, if all of us as a society can get through a day behaving like good kindergarten students, we will have an adjusted world society. In the meantime, um, I, I do the same thing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mentor. Um, I don't know many of them. Some are bigger, some are much more. But because I'm a woman, I don't think there's not a lot of us um, in the profession yet. Um, I volunteer um, for groups that um, hold up diverse voices until we can get to the future to shut them down. <laughs> well put. Thank you, all three of you, for your beautiful answers. Do you have anything that you would like to say as a final note on the topic that you feel like you haven't said it yet, or how, what, what note would you like to end on? I'd like to thank you, Diane. Uh, you've done a fantastic job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the space. It's a, it's a beautiful oh, space. Yeah. And I think we have to recognize Monty Belsera as well. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, um, if you guys would like, we're going to head upstairs where we're going to have the raffle. And you could have drinks. Uh, I'll play some music. And uh, we could talk more on the subject between ourselves as well. And then after that, we'll have an art auction. Um, for those who are interested, there are some beautiful pieces being auctioned off. Um, Imat couldn't make it to do his performance, but um, I'll just play some music instead. So thank you very much, and I'll see you guys up there.